This morning I invite you to take your hymnals, I mean take your Bibles. I'd like to take, take you to Revelation uh, 14. And we're going to read verse 8. I recommend it's a good idea to learn your Bible. It's, you might need it someday, if not sooner. Revelation 8, Revelation 14, verse 8. And another angel followed, saying, Behold, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This is the word of the Lord. May God bless it today is my prayer. The last time I worshipped with you and was uh, in this pulpit, we discussed the first angel's message and uh, I visited with your church school teacher that afternoon and she said, you know, it would have been uh, easier for us to follow the quotations you had if you'd put it on PowerPoint. And so that's what I've done for today's message. Put it on PowerPoint and uh, put my notes up there. And I hope it, uh, it comes through okay. Uh, and that I can see back there, that I can, I can see what's on the screen. But technology is a wonderful thing, isn't it? When it works. And uh, we hope it works today. The message, of course, the Revelation 14 is the three angels' messages. But the title of Revelation is the revelation of what? Of Jesus. The revelation of Jesus. <clears throat> now, some things in Revelation, uh, you might think, well, it's, it's hard to find Jesus there. But everything in Revelation is about Jesus. Because who gave the message of Revelation? In fact, who gave the whole Bible? The Apostle Peter tells us that the prophets and apostles wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit of Christ. And so we can't even open the Bible and read anything in the Bible except that we know that this is what Jesus has given us. These are the words, these are the revelations of what Jesus thinks and what he has given us to think about. The Bible is full of food for our minds, isn't it? Sometimes we get waylaid and uh, thinking about the world and all the problems and our work and our bills and our dreams and hopes and so forth. But the main thing to keep in mind, we think about Jesus. And so today in the second angel's message about that great city Babylon, just keep in mind that uh, this is a message from Jesus and there's something here about the way he thinks and about the way he judges and his truth and his mercy and his grace because that's true first of all I want to just call our attention to the fact that and I'll try this clicker here oh it worked isn't that great uh, to the message itself it's a, just a one verse message the second angel's message it says and another angel followed saying another angel followed the first angel and said Babylon is fallen is fallen and so there's two falls pointed out here at that great city and whenever Babylon's mentioned in Revelation it seems to be prefaced or somewhere in the sentence that it'll call it that great city that great city Babylon because she has made all nations drink now what does made mean what does that bring to your mind is it does that mean uh, it's up to you no, what's it mean? It means you better or else. She made all nations, this is a global thing, all around the world, drink of the wine of the, and then here's a phrase that 
is a puzzler sometimes. The wrath, the wrath of her fornication. Now, she's angry about something, and here's something that is called wine. It's labeled the wine of fornication. Now, people went to the wine store. Would they find, would they buy that kind of wine? If it, on the front it said, this wine is fornication. That'd be a strange label, wouldn't it? But that's, that's what this wine is labeled. And she's angry about it. Probably angry because all nations aren't eager to drink of it. So she's angry. She's trying to make everyone drink. And uh, they're, they're not so eager to do that. So this then is the scripture's uh, message of Babylon, the great city, and what we, what we know about it. Let's see, it didn't work that time. Here we go. I want to consider three points. Uh, first of all, who is Babylon the great city? The who? Answer the question. Number two, why is she fallen? And number three, what is the wine of the wrath of her fornication which she is pushing at all nations? Babylon's history begins with Nimrod. Remember that name way back in Genesis. Genesis 10 and 11 tells about it. Uh, chronologically, creation was about 4,000 B.C. Uh, Noah, 2,500 B.C. And you know we start at the big numbers and go up toward one, so we're, we're getting less and less. And then Nimrod was after the flood. But we don't know exactly where, when, but we do know that on the average, men were living about 450 to 500 years. And so if he uh, was born closer to Abraham, 2000 BC, he might have been contemporary with Abraham. We don't know about that, but it's possible. But this, so this gives us a kind of a chronological context for what we're going to discuss today. Nimrod's Babel. Well, Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth. And the beginning of the kingdom, of his kingdom, was Babel. They call it Babel, in the land of Shinar. Now, the record says that he built cities. He built four cities in Shinar uh, and five cities in Assyria, another country close by. Babel meant, originally, the gateway of the gods. Now, what does this tell you? Gods, plural. This isn't good, is it? Gateway of the gods, and uh, became known later as confusion. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. The Tower of Rebellion. Not only he built cities and he built Babel, but they said, come and let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, Nimrod means, has a, a different meaning. I don't think you'd, I've never heard of a kid named Nimrod. It means he shall rebel. He shall rebel. So we don't want to name our children Nimrod, do we? Now, why is it such a name? We don't know when he was given that name maybe later on because of his record. But God had already commanded uh, Noah. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and do what? Fill the earth. Go everywhere and scatter and, and build up the earth. What did Nimrod say? No, we're going to build a city. So and because if we don't, we're going to be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So indeed, he was a rebel, wasn't he? He was going against what God said to do. Let us make a name for ourselves. That tells you right there he was, it was based on selfishness. Let's be famous ourselves. A tower of idolatry. This from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 119. What, when the tower had been partially completed, Apartments splendidly furnished and adorned were devoted to their idols. So they were idolaters. And praised their idols of silver and gold. 
and set themselves against the ruler of heaven. So this, this tells you right in one paragraph what Nimrod and, and, and those who followed him were all about. Then the story of redemption tells us this. They reasoned that they would secure themselves in case of another flood. Well, God had given them a rainbow of promise, hadn't he? They were rebels. They didn't believe God. For they would build their tower to a much greater height than the waters prevailed in the time of the flood, and all the world would honor them. Here we go again with wanting to be famous in the eyes of other people. And they would be as gods and rule over the people. Well, if they wanted to be as gods, that makes them Antichrist, doesn't it? That was the first, first Antichrist that uh, the Bible speaks of because they wanted to be gods. A global empire was what they had in mind. Ever hear of a global village before? A global empire was what they had. That's, that was when it started, that kind of thinking. With idolatry and ruled by people who wanted to be God. Sounds like a New Age religion, doesn't it? Related. Paul the Apostle had, in his uh, opening to the book of Romans, spoke of this generation of people. Professing to be wise, they became fools and, char and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and uh, birds and four-footed animals and creeping things, idolatry. Therefore, God who gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, what was the lie? Not, not just any lie, but when it, the Bible talks about the lie, they're talking about the lie that Satan told to Eve when he was in the tree under the guise of a serpent. You shall be as God. And so Paul knew that this group of people under Nimrod's leadership they wanted to be, they wanted to take God's place. And they had many gods. So God judged ancient Babylon. The Lord said, well, he came down and he scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, when you take a group of idolaters like that, who had established a pagan religion based on idols, <coughs> rebelling against the God of heaven, and you scatter them over the, all the earth, what do you have? You have little villages all over the earth based on paganism. And that's why we send missionaries across. And that we find the same kind of religions, other different names, who are worshiping men. They're worshiping the memories of men. They're worshiping idols. They're worshiping all kind, everything except and ideas and philosophies, everything except the God of heaven. And so scattering them abroad scattered the paganism all over the earth. Now we come down in history and we know that Medes and the Persians defeated Babylon in 539 BC. Remember Daniel and his image there in Daniel the second chapter? We learned that Persia defeated Babylon in 539. Now, I want to quote from a historian. The defeated Chaldeans, that were the priests of Babylon, <clears throat> fled to Asia Minor and fixed their central college at Pergamos. It's one of the seven churches, isn't it? Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos. Here, independent of state control, they carried on the rites of their religion. Remember, Revelation speaks of Pergamos, says, I know your works, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And so the Babylonish rites and religion were transferred from Babylon when it was conquered by Persia over to the city of Pergamos. And there they carried on 
what Nimrod had founded. Uh, from Pergamos to Rome. Well, Pergamos was the seat of the Babylonish mystery, but when the king, and his name was Attalus III, 133 BC, the king of Pergamos bequeathed the kingdom to the Romans, and the whole cult was transferred to Rome. That's from R.A. Anderson's book on the Revelation. And so we see that the rites of Babylon, who, who, which began in the plains of Shinar, was transferred to Pergamos. From Pergamos, it went to Rome. Now, Rome is a, was the center of the empire, right? The Roman Empire uh, that extended from England clear over into just into East India and even beyond. Constantine's efforts was to mix paganism and Christianity. Well, Constantine was a Roman emperor, and so his idea was he was going to bring Christians and pagans together. It said, it is evident from all his statutory uh, provisions that the Roman emperor Constantine uh, began to, he sought the realization of his religious aim was the amalgamation of heathenism and Christianity. And so here we have the beginning of the Roman idea. We'll mix paganism with Christianity. We can have a mixture. J.A. Wiley says it this way, from the fourth century the corruptions of the Christian church continued with marked and rapid progress. The canons of churches councils were put in the room or the place of the word of God, the rule of faith. And thus the first stone was laid in the foundations of Babylon, the great city that made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So Babylon's wine was a mix of Christianity and heathenism. And John the Revelator knew that, and that's what he wrote. He didn't understand everything, but he did understand what he was shown. So it was fornication with paganism. That's the mix. That's why it's fornication. Christians with pagans. Wiley continues, while the living uh, oracles were neglected, the zeal of the clergy began to, sp to uh, spend itself upon rules and ceremonies borrowed from the pagans. Paul the Apostle had written about that when he left uh, the Ephesian elders and he said, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock also from among yourselves, right from the, the middle of the church, right from the Christian church, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. And we know that the uh, bishops of Rome inherited Rome when it was moved, the, the empire seat was moved to Constantinople. And uh, then they, that the Roman bishops were left there with the philosophy to mix paganism with Christianity. And that is what Wiley is talking about. They spent their time and their philosophy in, in this mix, this fornication with paganism. Here's from the Expositor's Bible on this topic. <clears throat> Babylon was rising. The shell of Babylon, the gorgeous city which rose by the Euphrates, has indeed sunk into heaps. But Babylon herself is not dead. And this struck me. Babylon never dies. The devil has a plan. He won't let it die. All through the centuries, he's, he hasn't let it die, and he won't let it die. We're talking about prophecy here. To the conscience of Christ's seer, John, this mother of harlots, though dead and desert in the east, came to life in the west. Now, Rome is, as at the current time, we're coming down to our day with this idea of Rome and fornication, and paganism, and uh, the great city Babylon, Rome is today announcing her determination to build this city up again, this great city. 
And I, I've, uh, I found this on the uh, website, the Vatican website. This is Benedict the Sixteenth. You know, he's waiting in the wings. He retired, didn't he? And so uh, Francis came. But this is what he wrote. And uh, I'll see if I can see it here. Um, Well, I can't, I can't read it too well. I didn't get that, uh, that big enough. But it says he's, he's busy with the idea of building of the universal city of God, which is the great, uh, which is the goal of the, of the human family. And he goes on to say that what his goal is for all peoples and all nations of the world is to shape the earthly city in unity and peace, rendering it to some degree an anticipation and a prefiguration of the undivided city of God. Now, the, the Church Father Augustine wrote a treatise on the city of God. And the idea of this is that, that uh, Rome will rule from the city of God a great global village and that will be the, the coming of the kingdom the messianic kingdom through the papacy that's the idea that uh, Benedict is, is talking about here and he goes on this is urgent need of the, of the true world political authority there's an urgent need of a true world political authority who do you think he has in mind to be the true world political authority As my predecessor, Blessed John the Twenty Third, uh, indicated some years ago, such an authority would need to be required by law, regulated by law. Pardon me, to observe consistently the principles of. Now, here's three words you should know about: subsidiarity, solidarity, and the common good. What does subsidiarity mean? Subsidiarity. That means that you put yourself under. You're under someone. And this is the principle that he's talking about. The principles that will rule the inhabitants of the world. Subsidiarity. Solidarity. What does that mean? Everybody's together, right? A big a togetherness of all religions and all peoples under this authority, this global authority, to seek to establish the common good. This is a common phrase with uh, the papal writings. What's the common good mean? That means that there are going to be a re-regulation of wealth, a redistribution of wealth around the world so that everyone is the same. It's kind of like uh, Rome has, has said that the nearest thing to their social policy is socialism and fascism because it's, it means that everything that you have belongs to all of us. Uh, we don't want a real wealthy people and if you, if you have something you won't share with someone else then uh, Rome says that we will walk in and take it from you and share it if you're so selfish like that. So here we go, here we go with Rome's policy, and they're coming, uh, they're coming right out. Rome is not bashful about what they plan to do; uh, they publish it. They also require the construction of a social order that at last conforms to the moral order. So all society should conform to a moral order. Whose morals do you think that? that we're talking about here. To the interconnection between moral and social spheres and to link between and the link between politics, economic and civil spheres as envisioned by the Charter of the United Nations. Now this is all in this encyclical that was distributed. Now here's Rome uh, in a manual for Christian doctrine. What then is the principal obligation 
of the heads of state, what, what does Rome consider the principal obligation of the heads of state? Their principal obligation is to practice the Catholic religion themselves, and as they are in power, to protect and defend it. May the state separate itself from the church? No, because it may not withdraw from the supreme rule of Christ. Now, this is, this is the way that Rome thinks, and this is their policy. And so this is why we have this warning in Revelation. We have a warning against a system that would uh, make everyone subsidiary to them and would demand solidarity and would demand a moral order be over them and that uh, moral order is a mix of paganism with Christianity. Now, if you're a, a real follower of Christ, that would cause some problems, wouldn't it? Don't you think that would cause you some problems? Some sleepless nights, maybe. Some decisions to make. The church and state in prophecy. Well, John writes about this. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery. It's a mystery religion. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And so what did God, is God telling us here? There's going to be a the great city will rule over who? It won't be like a democracy where the church has its sphere and the government its sphere. What we have in the United States here, a republic actually is what, what was envisioned. But uh, it will be a ruling of this great city over the political leaders of the earth. I thought it was interesting uh, to run into this. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now, <clears throat> you've heard of the, the poet Virgil, no doubt, in your studies. He wrote this, Rome has both become the uh, most beautiful city of the world and alone has surrounded uh, for herself seven heights with a wall. Another Roman um, poet wrote, the lofty city on seven hills which governs the whole world. And so I, I put this in here because it identifies Rome as being part of the prophecy. The seven heads are, se are seven hills, uh, the part of that prophecy. It's interesting that uh, poets it, were speaking of that even before Christ's day. Well, Babylon is a fallen church state. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. There are two falls listed here. And I, I want to think about that just for a minute. She's fallen away from the three doctrines uh, listed in the first angel's message. So when, when I, I was spoke here last time, I, I uh, talked about the, the three doctrines in the first angel's message. And while making all uh, nations drink of the wine of her fornication uh, with paganism. And number two, as a result, she falls under God's judgment and suffers total and eternal destruction. So she has two falls. One, she falls away from the truth of the first angel's message. And number two, she finally falls under God's judgment and is, is falling completely and destroyed forever. Uh, the falling away was prophesied by Paul the Apostle. He said, let no one deceive you by any means, for that city, that day will not uh, come except there comes a falling away uh, first. And so here we have a system that has indeed fallen away from scriptural truth. Uh, the first doctrine, uh, and, and I'm including this as a kind of a review, and uh, my time is up, so <laughs> I don't know whether to quit now or uh, what do you think? Okay, uh, should I finish then? Uh, this is a review, uh, a brief review of what was in the first angel's message. 
What are the three doctrines in the first angel's message? Well, the first one, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having what? The everlasting gospel. That's what the angel came with to preach. It's a global message uh, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Well, Rome counters that everlasting gospel that was, the, that, uh, was so clear in the days of the Reformation with uh, words like this. Penance and sacrament by which um, sins committed after baptism are forgiven through the absolution of the priests. Well, what does the gospel teach about forgiving sins? Who do you come to? There, there's only one mediator, is Jesus Christ. He said, come to me. And so uh, Rome has, has, uh, is mixed up there, uh, according to scripture. The Council of Trent had uh, Canon 8, it said this, if anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, that's what Galatians teaches without a doubt, uh, meaning that nothing uh, else is required in cooperation in order to obtain and uh, the grace of justification, let him be anathema. What does anathema mean? You don't, you don't want to be cursed, do you? Well, if you say that justification is by faith alone, you're under a curse according to Rome. Uh, Canon 24 of the Trent, Council of Trent, if anyone says that the justice, that is justification, received is not preserved and not increased before God through good works, but that these works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not the cause of its increase, let him be anathema. And so exactly what the scriptures teach is that justification is not increased by works, is it? Uh, Galatians uh, 2.16 makes that clear. We're not justified by works by any means. Works cannot merit anything with justification. The second doctrine of the first angel's message is the hour of his judgment has come. The hour of his judgment. He is our judge, Christ. He is our priest. He is our mediator. He is the head of the church according to the scriptures. Now here's what Rome says. The priest does not have to ask God to forgive our sins. Your sins are forgiven by the priests the same as if you knelt before Jesus Christ and told them to Christ himself. Bold words. Rome says this, the Pope takes the place of Jesus Christ on earth. Jesus left us the Holy Spirit. He is the true vicar of Christ, the head of the entire church. He is the infallible ruler, the universal ruler of truth, the supreme judge of heaven and earth, being judged by no one, God himself on earth. Very bold words in the face of Bible truth. The third, the third doctrine of the first angel's message was worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea. This is a direct reference to the fourth commandment, isn't it? We can see that, the seventh day Sabbath. But Rome says Sunday is a Catholic institution and is, its claims to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. From the beginning to the end of scripture, there is not a single passage that warrants the transfer of the weekly public worship from the last day to the week uh, of the week to the first. And so Rome is uh, very bold to announce that, yes, she did attempt to change the law of God. The church changed the observance of the Sabbath to Sunday. The Protestant claiming the Bible to be the only guide of faith has to warrant the observance of sun for the observance of Sunday. In this matter, the Seventh Day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. And so you didn't think that Rome knew about Seventh Day Adventists? Oh, they know our, our religion, and they know what we teach, and we know what they teach, and we know their religion. And so we both are very bold to announce what we uh, both teach, even though it's in opposition because we stand upon what uh, source for truth? The Bible, the Bible only, 
the great reformation principle and we're part of that reformation today ancient babylon's wine in god's cups you know when i read the experience of belshazzar there in daniel 5 it just struck me belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in jerusalem and the king and his lords his wives and his concubines drank from them they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver bronze and iron wood and stone when he did that he just crossed the line didn't he he was he was drinking alcoholic beverages in the cups that were dedicated to god this is a type or a symbol of modern babylon i saw that modern babylon fulfills that because it says the mystery, mystery Babylon uh, the great the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold precious stones and pearls having in her hand a golden cup full of uh, abominations and the filthiness of her fornication well in the Old Testament we have a lot of symbols and types that we can learn God knows the end from the beginning he knew what was going to happen today with this same system. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. You can't mix and be approved by God heathenism, paganism with Christianity. And this is what Rome has done throughout the centuries. And it began clear back with Nimrod in his hope to have an idolatrous uh, empire around the world. Well, this, this is... Uh, a, a historical uh, quote, but uh, the church from the very, uh, see, but I, I, I can't, I can't read it. You're going to have to read it. You read it yourself. <laughs> this is uh, a publication by Rome in which she announces the fact that she from the first has taken pagan practices and baptized them into the church and uh, this is okay because she uh, by by being the vicar of Christ on earth and being God on earth she has the authority to do this and so she admits that uh, pagan cults and their practices she has mixed with the Christian uh, with the Christian religion well, Babylon will finally fall. She's fallen away from the truth of the word of God. And the scriptures say the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city for in one hour, your judgment has come. So the, the economic, the financial uh, systems of the world, the political systems of the world, the civil systems of the world, they will all be ruled by Babylon, uh, modern Babylon, Rome, according to the word of prophecy. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her, for your merchants were the great men of the earth. For by your sorcery, all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets, saints, and of all who were slain on the whole earth. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. And the cup which she has mixed, mixed double for her. Well, 
the Persians came in and old Babylon fell in one night and that was it for Babylon the same will happen to modern Babylon there will be a great fall uh, a fall from truth and a fall from world dominion to obscurity and destruction then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea saying thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore and so there won't be a great city anymore but there will be there will be a great city and it will be called the new Jerusalem it won't be as many are, are thinking today who are, are uh, referring their lives to the Torah and keeping the old feast they won't, it won't be old, old, ba- old Jerusalem built up again no that, that won't happen it will be a new Jerusalem now I saw a new heaven a new, and a new earth the first heaven and the first earth had passed away also there was no more sea then I John saw the holy city new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his God and so that will be the messianic age and it's the age to come and I'm, I'm glad for that aren't you today that we have a city and a king who is a, a, a God of love and his morals will rule forever and ever today the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been commissioned to give a great final message of a call an invitation to the world that, that's why you and I are Seventh-day Adventists we're Seventh-day Adventists because we have accepted a challenge from God to say come out of her my people lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues there's a time when a great call is to go forth a great final call empowered by the Holy Spirit in a great measure it'll even be much more powerful than Pentecost talked about Pentecost in the Sabbath school lesson oh it'll it'll envelop the whole world it'll enlighten the whole world and so uh, you and I will be part of that that's our commission as Seventh-day Adventists now here's a here's a statement from the great controversy 588 and when you read this I'd like I'd like to uh, let you know uh, that this is something that struck me with the need to make a decision to make a commitment today you know if we don't commit today when things are going great will we tomorrow when things aren't going so so wonderful when we're in the pinchers no we won't it'll be very hard men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal declaring the words which God gives them the sins of Babylon will be laid open the fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority the inroads of spiritism the stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power all will be unmasked by these warnings the people will be stirred thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like these before so do you want to be part of this number that that says with with faith and prayer we'll be constrained to go forth under the power of God with a message a last warning message do you want to be part of that number I want to be part of that number I want the courage and the loyalty to the truth to God's truth that will be under fire Uh, the people of the Reformation faced it people in other countries are facing it they have tyrants who uh, who don't want Christianity they faced it for years but here in the United States it's sleepy time isn't it the virgins are asleep they're waiting for the for the great for the bridegroom but that time will change now with these warnings in mind what do you think 
Do you think it's time to take up our Bibles anew? And the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus to this church is the spirit of prophecy. Don't let it be put down or the scriptures be put aside. There's all kinds of references today, but they don't, they, people are wanting to put aside doctrine and just say, well, just have a relationship with Jesus and just say Jesus. Well, yes, that's true. We want to have a relationship with Jesus, but we need to preach the doctrine. We need as a church to lift up the third angel's message, the three angels' messages. Amen? What do you say? Are we Seventh-day Adventists or not? That's the, that's the choice to make. We are Seventh-day Adventists. And we need to seek God in prayer and for the courage and the loyalty to stand true uh, and, and be part of this great movement. Well, in a little while, after the storm is over, we'll be going home. And so I chose uh, for our closing hymn, that hymn, on 626, it says, in a little while, we're going home. And uh, do, do you lead this in this uh, hymn? Well, I think you sing better than I do. <laughs> Let us all sing. Let's stand and sing our closing song. Let us sing a song that will cheer us by the way. In a little while we're going. For the night will end in the everlasting day In a little while we're going home In a little while, in a little while We shall cross the billows foam We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past In a little while we're going Do the work that our hands may find to do In a little while we're going home And the grace of God will our daily strength renew In a little while we're going home In a little while, in a little while We shall cross the billows foam we shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while we're going home. There's a rest beyond, there's relief from every care. In a little while we're going home. And no tears shall fall in that city bright and fair. In a little while we're going home In a little while, in a little while We shall cross the billows foam We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past In a little while we're going Father, we're thankful for the word of truth. We want to stand by the truth. And we pray that you will bless us with the Holy Spirit day by day. So that day by day, we will grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. From glory to glory, to be like Christ our Lord. Oh, Father, we want to be loyal to you. Put that in our hearts as we face the future. In a little while, we will be going home. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Dismiss us, Lord, with blessing we pray. As
us from thy worship we go our 